All right, so chapter three is a general overview of biostatistics. We'll go over some terms that you've seen before, but we're gonna rejog our memory on what things mean. So what is biostatistics? What does it do and where it is inscribed in sort of the tree of statistics? So roughly speaking, biostatistics is just statistics applied to biomedical problems. Although as we've talked about before, the concepts are the same and they can be applied to any research question you might have. Um, one thing that biostatistics stresses is decision-making because it applies to helping clinicians and researchers uh, make decisions about the healthcare of people. So an understanding of uncertainty and variability is crucial. It also helps you design and analyze experiments. It attempts to remove some biases or at least find alternatives on how to uh, overcome them. And it helps generally speaking with experimental design, measurement, description, statistical graphics, et cetera, et cetera. And the branches of statistics are frequentist, which is the most common one, Bayesian, which has picked up a lot of steam in recent years, and likelihoodist, which is a bit like Bayes without priors. I've never encountered a likelihood analysis or something that's called likelihood in the wild. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if this book goes over some, or I've encountered them and I just didn't know that that was like a likelihood one. Logistic regression is considered like log likelihood, isn't it? Or, uh, no, 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 that's, that's log, uh, that's log odd, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure at all. <laughs> Um, all right, so some general things about the principles of statistics is we use methods that are hopefully grounded in theory or deriving from extensive simulation. We understand or want to understand uncertainty. We design these experiments to maximize the information that we are given and understand the sources of variability. We strive to use as much of this information as possible during analysis, um, et cetera, et cetera. So what can statistics do? It's a bit of a repetition of what we've been previously talking about is it allows you to refine measurements. It allows you to get better experimental design with minimizing some bad stuff like wasting subjects or uh, minimizing the sources of biases, et cetera. And it can be used for very powerful applications like causal inference where you're not just establishing association between things, but you're actually saying one might be causing um, something. And uh, there's just so, so many more benefits and uses of biostatistics and you can check them out with this link over here. So the types of data analysis and inference, we have descriptive sort of analysis, we have what's called inference, where you take your findings from a sample and you infer it to a general population. We have Bayesian inference and we have predictive analysis. So this data analysis flowchart is very helpful with trying to figure out what your question is gonna be doing, like what kind of analysis it's gonna be. So if you didn't summarize the data at all, then you're not doing data analysis. And if you are, then things start to get interesting. So did you report the summaries, but you just didn't interpret them? Like let's say you just threw your results in a table, then what you're doing is descriptive. If you've actually made an attempt at interpretation, then it can be any of these five. 
And I think we've all had experience with doing these. One that stood out to me was this mechanist, mechanistic one. And I threw this up on Twitter because I, I had never seen an analysis call itself mechanistic. So if you have any examples, uh, let me know. Um, I saw your query on Twitter and I, um, he, the um, Harwell included a reference to a science paper. Unfortunately, because I'm off campus, I don't have access to um, the science archives. I'd like to pull that uh, paper because it's about um, um, correct interpretation of uh, st statistical tests, and I think it could be really useful. But if I can get access to that, uh, I'll, I'll try to share it. Okay. So I'm sorry about so, this. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Going back one second. Is mechanistic um, like um, enzyme analysis? Is that is that a I, you know I can't remember doing mechanistic either. But is that just you know where you're talking about um, uh, you know uh, inhibitors, um, allosteric inhibitors, different inhibitors like that? Basically, you're looking at well, no, no, no. I'm thinking more kinetics. I'm sorry. I'm thinking. I'm tired. I'm thinking of all sorts of weird things. Sorry. No, no, it's all right. It's all right. It's I. My guess would be it's it's not when you take the average treatment effect or something. It's when you do it for individuals. I don't know. It's I'll I'll have to. I I tried quickly googling it, but I just I couldn't find anything. I'll try to figure it out for next time. All right, so sorry about this slide. I don't know why one is bleeding into the other, but this is its own slide. It's just the, the common mistakes that people make when thinking their analysis is one way, but it's actually the other way. And uh, this is how colloquially you would describe your error. So if you're doing inference, but you think you're doing causation, then yeah, correlation does not imply causation. And um, the other one is data dredging, overfitting, and then end of one analysis. So I had like, I found this website with all the statistical fallacies with cute little cartoons like this. And so this is the first one. This is the trap of thinking something causes the other uh, when it doesn't, right? So we have, and I hate the way they did this, where like the, there's like two, anyways, I'm not <laughs> gonna get into it, but basically the, the green line here is temperature and you can see it going up with time and then pirates, I guess the count of pirates going down with time and then you might, think because they grow and decrease in the same way that one causes the other. So like does like, for example, climate change or global warming cause the decrease in number of pirates? Well, no. Um, so while this example is, is super obvious, uh, you know, when you're dealing with biomedical problems, you might very easily fall into this trap. So it's important to understand the limitations of the uh, models you use. Can you share that in the chat? Yeah, absolutely. I will. I'll do that now, actually, before I forget. There's some really good ones, too, in this website. Like, I didn't know of this one called the McNamara fallacy. <laughs> I feel like this is easy to do with just the abundance of data that we have in certain fields like sports or medicine. Yeah, I highly encourage everyone to check these out. And today I've just focused on the ones that are brought up in this, in this table because I'm assuming these are the ones that show up uh, the most, the errors that show up the most. 
So what is data dredging? Data dredging is the failure to acknowledge that the correlation was in fact the result of chance. And this can happen a lot when you're like just absolutely gun ho on trying to find something of significance and you keep regrouping and removing things and adding things back into your model until you try to find something that's that's data dredging and it's not recommended at all. And hence the importance of really defining your question before you delve into the data to avoid falling into this trap. And this is just one of the traps you could fall into by uh, not establishing a strong question before delving into the data. There's another one called double dipping that Professor Daniela Witten gave a talk on at the um, Our Medicine Conference. That presentation was excellent. I think it's not up yet on YouTube, but I will definitely link it on, on Slack. Uh, can, you, can you explain what double dipping refers to? Uh, I don't want to do that because I think I, I need to rewatch the video first to be able to speak intelligibly about it. Sure, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Oh, no, no, just... no worries, no worries. Um, but she she like illustrated it with like a PCA example and I just need to refresh my mind about that and I'll, I'll link it in Slack and give like an executive summary, so to speak, of the presentation because I thought it was really, really interesting. But basically to avoid this like double dipping problem, just make sure that again, you have your question before doing EDA, like exploratory data analysis and make sure that you also have like all your independent variables um, already decided upon, so to speak. Like don't do your EDA and then realize, oh, I should also include this and this and that. Um, Cause then you could fall into that trap. All right, common mistake number two is overfitting. So on the left here, you have a line that's overfitted to these like sort of outliers here. Um, and this is a problem. It's especially a problem in fields like machine learning because your model might do really well on your testing validation sets, but then when applied to the real world, it'll all fail because this is not representative. This is not the most representative of um, the black dotted data, this is. And then cherry picking, of course, which is um, the end of one analysis or focusing on things that don't really exist. For example, a line that's sort of overfitted to some outliers can make you see a trend when it's not there at all. So here are some more definitions. Um, first one is the response variable. So that's like your outcome variable. I always like to call them outcome, not to get confused. So in the context of a biomedical problem that could be like a clinical endpoint or a final lab measurement. And you have your independent variables, which are the predictor or descriptor variables. You have your adjustment variables, also known as confounders. So those are things that affect your independent variable. And then you have your experimental variables, which is just the things that the researcher controls, like for example, the treatment or the dose. Um, and we make the distinction because independent variables are oftentimes something that is not controlled by the investigator. So let's talk about what makes an outcome variable bad and what makes it good. Um, there's a lot of things that could make it bad, but these are the top three. Uh, one, the first one is dichotomizing your response variable or binning your response variable. And um, that just means, for example, if your, if your outcome variable or response variable was BMI, body mass index, 
um, you'll see a lot of research just arbitrarily picking a BMI value of like, let's say 30, which is usually um, the value that people decide makes you obese or not. And they'll do that. And there's really no reason to dichotomize a variable because you can run into lots of problems that we'll see in the next few slides. And then its cousin is binning, where now let's imagine we take BMI, but we cut it up in even more groups, like BMI from 18 to 21, 22 to 25, like, et cetera. So that's binning. Another problem is if your outcome variable is based on a change in a subject's condition, whereas what is truly important is the subject's most recent condition. So I guess this is like a very medical, um, this, this applies more to the, to the medical setting is we want the patient's most recent um, condition as opposed to something that's older. And then this one I had to really wrap my head around and we'll go over an example. But if your outcome is based on a change when the underlying variable is not monotonically related to the ultimate outcome, indicating that positive change is good for some subjects and bad for others. That's a mouthful. If you don't get it, that's okay. We'll go over it in the next slide. Uh, but what makes a good outcome variable is when it captures the underlying structure or process. So this like sounded good to me, but I, I don't know what that practically means. Like how can I check if my outcome variable captures the underlying structure or process or whatever? Is that just something from like just having domain expertise about like the disease or the problem that I'm looking at and knowing that that's a good outcome for it. Seems like R square could help a lot. Yeah, residual analysis, right? Because like if there's structure in your residual, if you have a model, then you're not describing as much as you should. Um, gotcha. okay. That would be a way to get to that. But yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right, Matt, that R squared, understanding how much variance you're actually um, attributable to what you have in your analysis is good. Uh, and the correlation between the process you have and the um, variable you're choosing, right, is your response. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, thanks. So has another good thing to have is for it to have low measurement error. So that took me back to the days of like chem lab or physics lab where they would make you take like five measurements of the same thing to reduce the error. So that's what that is. And it's used a lot in practice, especially for like clinical trials or just research involving the measurement of blood pressure. Blood pressure is like notorious for going up and down. And there's also like the white coat effect where people's blood pressure goes up when they have a doctor or a nurse in the room. So that's really interesting and makes a lot of sense. Um, and then you want it to have the highest resolution available. So you just, you want it to be what it is. Um, so if it's continuous, um, then the underlying measurement is continuous. If it's ordinal, um, it is so, and then binary. And then you also, as much as possible, want the same interpretation for every type of subject. So the directionality should be maintained. Sorry, a quick question. Uh, did you say that you, um, for the third problem on this slide, did you say you're going to get to that on the next slide? Yes, yeah, we'll go over okay. um, an example. Okay. Yeah, that one was tough for me. All right, this is, this is problem number three that we're gonna go over. So, so again, it's problematic when the outcome is not monotonically related to a variable. And here's an example. Uh, let's say you have a variable where when it's too low, it's bad, but when it's too high as well, it's bad. So this thing happens with um, serum creatinine, which is a, a lab measurement that they sometimes take if you're in the hospital sick with certain things. Uh, and serum creatinine is important because it helps us diagnose this. 
acute kidney injury and how clinicians decide whether you have this acute kidney injury is they take the ratio of your previous or baseline creatinine um, to the current value. And if it's above a certain threshold, then they say, okay, you have acute kidney injury. If it's below that threshold, you don't have it. And it's it's funny, I <laughs> when I watched this, this video, because all his, all, all the chapters are available as video too, because he goes over them. He, he was like, there were, there's absolutely no reason why they defined it this way, but they, he literally said it was pulled out of thin air, but it's good for illustrative purposes of what we're about to see here. So let's look at serum creatinine, which is the x-axis. Um, and then the, yeah, the x-axis and the y-axis is the risk of hospital death. So just risk of dying basically. And you can see that when serum creatinine is like very, very low, the risk is slightly higher than when the serum creatinine increases. So he calls this a hockey stick variable. And he says, there's a lot in, in medicine that are sort of like this, a lot of physiological and like lab ones that, that follow this, this pattern. And if you see this in your own work, be careful with having an outcome where you are essentially taking the ratio or the difference of two values in time. Because what that does is that it can hide the fact that having a lower value of that lab measurement is not always good. So that's if, the, if, if, that's if the, I can, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Um, it's funny because when I was reading this part of the chapter and I was trying to th think of an instance of what he was describing, I actually thought of BMI, which you used for another uh, example with the problem one. But I think that's also a problem three type variable in that if somebody's BMI has increased by two, it can be either bad or good, depending on where they started from. Uh, now it's it's generally treated as a, as a you know just a, a value and it's a very problematic uh, value anyway we, we, for many reasons, but I think that uh, that that would if, if we were to map it not as um, not as a, a, an absolute value but as change over the last twelve months let's say then I think we would probably get a similar hockey stick type of um, um, situation. Yeah, that's interesting and. Um... He, he kind of previewed how to avoid this problem uh, by setting up your model in a certain way, but also just not, just not factoring in the baseline measurement, because that's oftentimes not what's important for the outcome, at least in medical setting. Just take the most recent one. So again, some basic definitions, again, of the types of measurements that we might have. So binary is yes or no, you know, whether they've scored or not scored, present, absent, whether you have the disease or not. So it's kind of like an all or nothing situation. Categorical, so when you have more than two values that are not necessarily in special order, so we have different ones under that umbrella. We have nominal ones. So that's things like race, you know, whether you're white, Asian, wait, yes, race. <laughs> um, Polly Thomas, I think that's the same thing as multinomial. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but that means just more than two categories. So like for sports, it would be something like win, lose, or tie. Like those would be three categories. And then discrete is this sort of the same thing. You have these different categories, but there's like numbers inside them, if that makes sense. So like things like income levels, for example. 
like zero to 50,000, 50,000 to 100,000. And then there's like values in those, in those little categories. Then we have ordinal variables. So that's when there's like an order to things. So just like the income one that I mentioned, that one is ordered, right? Cause it's like increasing. We have count ones where it's a discrete variable that in theory has no upper limit. So that's something like maybe car accidents per month. We have continuous ones and Frank Harrell is very opinionated about these for right reasons. Um, continuous variables he thinks have the most information in them. They're the easiest to standardize slash normalize. And uh, he cautions us about a few things with them that we'll go over in the next slide. So he says, again, to never dichotomize a continuous or ordinal variable because the dichotomization slash the binning is arbitrary. Uh, you can have a loss of interpretability, which is funny because clinicians are obsessed with binning and dichotomizing because for them it helps makes interpretations easier. Uh, because in medicine, we use a lot of like hazards ratios and odds ratios. And for some reason, they find it easier to say that for this age group, the likelihood of you getting this disease is X. Um, they don't like the other interpretation of, let's say, if you had kept age continuous. For some reason, they find it less intuitive to say one unit increase in age leads to a likelihood of this for this disease. So <laughs> it's interesting and um, kind of opposites there. And then you can have massive loss of information by doing this. And he has like a pretty dramatic example of this in the book that I didn't quite understand. So I'll pull that up once I'm finished going over these. And then, yeah, never use change from baseline as your response variable. So that's kind of the thing we got into with the creatinine. Um, and also when you do this, there's a lot of hidden assumptions that you might not be aware of, but you can read up on them. And we'll talk about them more in chapter 13 as well. Another thing he says to avoid doing as much as possible is pre-processing of your data. So things like standardizing and normalizing. He thinks normalizing should be the final step right before you show your results. That's interesting. I don't know why he doesn't delve into it, but if someone knows, please speak up. Uh, determine which measurements are required for answering the question before your EDA to avoid rationalization bias. So that's kind of the thing we saw with data dredging. And again, double dipping, which I will link in the Slack shortly. And then make sure that the use of observational data respects causal pathways. So yeah, so that's when you don't want to include, you don't want to accidentally include like an outcome as one of your independent variables. Um, so make sure you're not doing that, especially in the context of medical stuff. That's, that's very bad. Okay, and then references that you can check out. Again, it's that uh, website with the, with the cartoons of the different statistical fallacies, and this is just a book. All right, let me try to find um, the part where he talks about the loss of information. I posted something about mechanistic uh, modeling in the chat as well. Oh, cool. Can you, can you read it to me? Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's from a course like advanced data science. I think Jeff Leak is one of the, the um, instructors on it. And so for mechanistic data analysis, it says that it's seeking to demonstrate that changing a measurement always and exclusively leads to a specific effect. So like, 
causal, you're looking at average effect, deterministic, you're saying that this will always lead to um, a specific effect, a chain uh, effect in the data. And then it also mentions that outside of engineering, you, you find it to be very challenging and rarely undertaken. Gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. I think that is very close to um, the mechanistic that I was describing for, you know, chemistry. I mean, you're, you're looking at, you're trying to tease out the mechanism of your process and by changing, you know, one thing by adding an inhibitor, you know, are you changing the overall function of it? So I, I see the, I see the similarities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you were like right, right there, same, same ballpark. And then for double dipping, who did you say you saw that with? Yeah, I can, let me just pull it up. Because I, I swear I remember hearing us talk about that and she was talking about you take clusters and then you try to um, prove that they're statistically different from each other. It's like you take clusters in your data, you find these centroids and you, you group your data and then you test <laughs> that the averages are actually different within the groups, between the groups and that was double dipping um, in that case. So I wonder if that's the same. I think, yeah, that sounds familiar. Um, yeah. Also, something that's really funny is <laughs> Frank Carroll is very opinionated about his hatred for dichotomization. I think because he's a biostatistician that deals with clinicians all the time. So something fun would be to just like look up his handle and dichotomization and just see him again and again talk about how horrendous it is for different applications. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, let me look up Daniela Witten. Oh, that is her, okay, yeah, Daniela Witten. I wonder if the video is up yet. Does she include her slides? No. Yeah, I remember I attended that um, webinar and it seemed like an obscure use case, but it was interesting. Yeah. And I actually zoned out just because I, I couldn't connect it to anything I was working on, but it was, yeah, she's a good presenter. I do. I, I really do need to watch it again because like one of the, one of the use cases she does is clustering. Like that's really quite popular uh, at least in like sports and and medicine so here it is but no I don't think it's been uploaded yet it's been uploaded to YouTube oh amazing okay yes here it is it's very long because it was a keynote <laughs> <laughs> production I might even remove a few outliers I explore my data in all sorts of different ways and then realistically then I decide what hypotheses I want to test and the problem is that the the typical framework that we use for thinking about our data analysis and for hypothesis testing does not allow us to do this like this this practice of how data analysis is performed is really not allowable Right. So she says, yeah, she says, don't, don't like go into your data and then generate your hypothesis. You should have it already set up. That's the first point she makes. So why is there this gap between theory and practice? Well, it has to do with the way that we've been generating data increasingly in the last couple of decades. And the point is that there's been a real shift in the way that we collect the data and in the reasons we've collected the data away from hypothesis testing and towards hypothesis generation. So it used to be that researchers would collect a data set and they'd say like, okay, you know, I'm gonna measure these four proteins in, in mouse tumors and I just wanna know, do these protein levels go up or do they go down over the course of the, um, the tumor progression in the mice? And so if, if you're collecting data to answer like a very specific question like that, then yeah, you can specify your hypotheses in advance and it's easy to be virtuous in your data analysis. But uh, that's really not often how we're collecting data today. Nowadays, we're collecting larger and larger data sets. And we typically don't have a specific hypothesis that we want to test. We don't have a specific question in mind. 
Instead, we're increasingly collecting data with an eye towards hypothesis generation. So the point is, we collect data and we just want to find something interesting in the data. And then also we want to double check that what we found and that we thought was interesting really is interesting. So in particular, often we're generating a hypothesis based on a data set, and then we're testing the hypothesis based on that same data set. And in this talk, I'm going to refer to this practice as double dipping. And I think a lot of you have intuition for the fact that even though this is something that we do all the time, this is very deeply problematic from a statistical perspective. And we can really run into a lot of trouble if we, if we do this double dipping and we're sort of not careful about how to account for it in our analysis. So I'm going to give you a few examples of double dipping. And these are, in particular, three examples that I've been studying in my research group. So the first example of double dipping has to do with clustering. So here I have like 100 observations on two features. And if you want, you can think about this as data with just two variables that we've measured. Or you can think about this as data where I've projected onto the first two principal components. But the idea of clustering is that I take these observations. I, for example, perform hierarchical clustering, maybe, to find three clusters. And then I can now label the observations according to these clusters that I've estimated. OK, so it turns out that clustering, which is just such a fundamental tool across so many areas of, of research and data analysis, um, really naturally leads to a big double dipping problem. And that's really going to be the focus of my talk today. So, so what goes wrong? Well, let's say that I sample 100 observations from a noise model. So these observations are shown in black. And there's no signal here. There are no true clusters. These observations are just generated like normal 0, 1. But I can cluster the observations, just see. And I, I will get clusters because if I cluster data and I ask for like, you know, three clusters using hierarchical clustering, I will get three clusters. Because look and you will find, you can always find clusters even if they're not real. And then I can say, well, okay, are those clusters that I got really real? Is there a difference in means between the estimated clusters? And actually what happens is a little bit alarming, which is I can say like, well, what, you know, what's the mean of the, the blue cluster? What's the mean of the green cluster? What's the mean of the, the orange cluster? I can measure how far apart they are. I can compute a p-value using, for example, like a z-statistic or a t-test. And what I get are really, really tiny p-values. All three of those p-values are very small. So this is really bad because, again, if you remember how I generated the data, there was no signal here. There were no true clusters. But when I did clustering and then I tested for a difference in means, I've now rejected the null hypothesis of no difference in means between the clusters. So I would erroneously think that these clusters are real. OK, so you're, you're probably listening to this talk. And you're like, OK, but that would be really naive analysis. Obviously, the problem. OK, I think I'll stop here. Um, I will link this in the slack so you can see how to overcome this issue and i'll put it in the chat as well but really fascinating stuff by daniela and her team i think they are working on releasing a package soon if it's not already released out there so watch out for that if you have to do clustering for your for your analysis and then I think Frank also has a good video uh, on dichotomization and why it's problematic. Uh, I think he does it with like simulation. I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's somewhere on. I'll try to find it on Twitter. I think I had seen it. <laughs> Crimes against data. Here it is. Mm. 
This is a demonstration that's run under R with R Studio. Um, so first we get access to the Sorry, I'm page. pausing it. I think it's it's a little too long for us to watch together. So I'm just gonna link these on the Slack. All right, so that's all I've got for today. Um, and next week, Tony will present the next chapter, which focuses on, I'm pretty sure, descriptive statistics and graphic stuff. I remember that presentation was, was really nice because I was exposed to different graphs that I had never seen before and why they're better at representing certain things than others. So make sure to come back next week and we'll go over that. Has, uh, if I can interject, has anyone seen, um, has anyone used Kaggle? No. Kaggle.com, no. Um, K-A-G-G-L-E, if you check it out, there's a, a ton of work on machine learning. But one of the, you reminded me of, the, of you reminded me of something Thing. There was one notebook that I found where this guy generated 70 different graphics for different data, and he put them all in one notebook, one spreadsheet. And it's really cool to just look at the different ones. And you can kind of Google that in, or search it in Kaggle. So if you're interested. Uh, Asma, I want to say a couple things. First of all, I was totally triggered by your battery level. Yeah, um, so am I. That's why I'm trying to wrap it up. I'm like, we should watch this together. I actually really wanted to watch it, but I, I'm afraid of my stuff dying and I don't know where my charger is. <laughs> okay, and, and I was trying to remember where I saw um, Daniela Witten's name recently, and it was on about that nature paper that was published this week. Yeah, you know what? I was feel so strongly about that. Like, she, she, are, are you referring to when she's like, delete your tweet or something to the dude that? Oh, paper? yeah, but, but she linked the paper, and I've had the paper open in my browser ever since, and I go back oh, to God. it. Let me, let me stop the recording, because I'm going to start talking shit. One second. <laughs>